I wanted to start with this particular picture because you see a man in front of the cottage and it was an image I just saw on Facebook recently. And what might not be so obvious is what is behind him. Um, the women in the shadows of history. And I just realized I clicked too quickly, but nonetheless, uh, this actually is Eliza Oliver here on the uh, left with her husband, David. Picture probably taken in the 1860s and she was not the woman in that slide I had just before that. Um, uh, but she did grow up in a cottage not unlike that. Uh, this is a cottage at Killinure where Eliza lived as a child. And it's a curious one. You can see the, the rounded corner on it right here. And I can't date this cottage, but it was shown in an 1835 map. Uh, it's apparently a tradition where uh, uh, buildings without corners are done that way so the devil doesn't have a place to hide, which is something that Eliza would uh, definitely agree with. Uh, that's something she would not want. Um, the cottage itself, uh, in behind it, is a larger building uh, and uh, we can date that house uh, because of the letters from Eliza. Now I'm just going to have to try and change something here because I'm getting the, whoops, sorry about that. I'm going to just go back one. Uh, what's happening for me right now, and I'm sorry about this, I just need to figure out how to fix it, is that the uh, pictures uh, there um, of people uh, were overriding what I had and I couldn't see what I had. So let me try and see if this works better. Um, so we can date the big house that's in behind the cottage and it was built by Thompson Brown uh, in the 1880s when times were better in the area. And uh, at the initially, uh, Eliza's daughter Bessie and her family were living in this cottage. And uh, Eliza says they're not gonna be comfortable until they get a new house built. And then not long afterwards, 1883, Eliza spent a fortnight there, very pleased with the new house. And this is the one in behind. Uh, it's both handsome and comfortable, and they have a governess, and they're doing very well. Uh, this second cottage was not the one she was raised in, but this is the cottage where Eliza lived with her husband for the first several years of their marriage. He had 86 acres here. I don't know how he got the lease, but when they married in 1838, her diary was 300 pounds. And they lived here when their first five children were born. So imagine there's five children and the parents in this cottage. Somehow, and I don't know why, David lost the lease to this land sometime around 1847. So that's famine times. And they then had to move to Urker to his mother's farm. Meanwhile, Eliza's aunts were living at Cavanagh on the left and Derry Valley on the right. Both of these uh, properties are described in her letters. Both of them are obviously more prosperous than the kind of property that she grew up in and went to as a young wife. Uh, Barbara Donaldson and Margaret Bradford were the two aunts who lived at Cavanagh where Eliza went when she was 10 years old when her mother died. Uh, Margaret Bradford is one of those women who's like the woman in the shadow in that picture I started with. Barbara Donaldson, there's a bit more known because she was the wife of William Donaldson, who was the head of United Irishmen in South Armagh in the late 1700s. And she was also, uh, and this is really significant, um, a very important mentor of Eliza's son, Thomas Jackson, who became Sir Thomas Jackson. And when he arrived in Hong Kong in 1863 at eight o'clock in the morning on the boat, before the boat left again at eight o'clock in the evening, there was a letter on it that TJ, as he was known, wrote to his aunt Barbara to just let her know he'd arrived and had some thoughts about politics. So I, I mentioned that because the importance of letter writing in the family and the importance of women in shaping the um, both religious and political minds of all of the children. This is a quick snap here of Thomas and his brother David. Both of them were bankers in Hong Kong and Yokohama and were it not for the success that they had in the Far East, uh, the farm at Urker would have been lost uh, to the Jacksons and also a number of other families who benefited from their uh, help with building new houses and such 
would never have happened. Also the school in uh, Cross McGlenn, um, a significant uh, set of donations from uh, TJ that kept the school going in the early 1900s. So I found about 80 of her letters. I don't know how many have been lost, but she did write every Friday to her son. So you can figure that he was in Hong Kong from uh, 1863 uh, and he died in, well, she died actually more to the point in 1903. There was a significant culling of the letters in the 1950s. I don't know what we lost. Now, when I was trying to make sense of them, uh, you can really get lost in all the detail. And I decided to do this little Venn diagram because it seemed to me that there were sort of three categories of that she kept on touching on in virtually every letter, her faith, the farm and family. And it seemed to me that any time you don't pay attention to all three of them, you're missing something essential about Eliza because she saw these three things as absolutely totally integrated in her life. I also then imagine myself hovering over the pile of letters as if I was in a drone. And at that level of looking down on the letters, there's two contradictions that seem to play out in her letters. On the one hand, God is love and goodness knows she tried hard to live that kind of life. But at the same time, she's got the side of her where she's just gonna push hard and get what she wants. And the phrase either death or victory comes to mind. And that's because that phrase was in the arms of her son, Thomas Jackson, when he was knighted in 1899. And she wrote a letter before then in 1887, which is I think revealing whether it's faith in God or the old blood of dairy on the Boyne, that is the cause I'm not much given to fear for the future. Well, she's not quite honest there because she feared quite often, but she did do her darndest not to fear. Uh, the, the line in uh, the arms of uh, Sir Thomas Jackson are echoed in a Robert Burns poem, uh, which ends, a verse ends, let us do or die. And to me, that's pertinent because in her letters, Robert Burns is her most favorite poet. She quotes him all the time. So the last thing I want to draw your attention to is in the arms of Sir Thomas is the red hand of Ulster in the upper left hand corner. So where did I find all these letters? Various places. I'm going to just quickly touch on all of them. The first letter I held in my hand was in October 2003 and it was thanks to Tina Staples, who's the chief archivist at HSBC. Uh, in this letter, Eliza's writing to her son on the occasion of his marriage. And she says to him, oh, my dear children, be helpers of each other on this heavenly earth. Be most attentive and affectionate and confiding to the dear girl that has left all for you and be particularly careful of her health. She's very young and her constitution cannot be fully formed yet. So it's important to uh, recognize that uh, Minnie, as she was called, the wife, was 20 years old when she married. Eliza was 23 years old when she married. I don't know uh, exactly what Eliza's concerns were, but this is what she's telling her son. Uh, I took this picture here to the left because one of the lions that is outside the HSBC office in London and also in Hong Kong is named Stitt and it's named after Gordon Stitt, who was one of the bankers of HSBC who came from County Armagh, as did about a dozen others. Uh, Eliza was, if nothing, a, well, she should have been hired by HSBC as a recruiter. Um, she kept on sending all kinds of Armagh boys over to Hong Kong. So in 2003, after I'd been to uh, HSBC, I went over to uh, Christine Wright had invited me to Guilford Castle. This is a picture of a bureau that included some of Eliza's letters. And most of these letters have been saved by Mary Minari, who had married James Francis Wright, and she was the daughter of Eliza's daughter, Mary Jackson. So by the time I show up in 2003, these letters have been saved by the women for four generations. Also in 2003, I met the Bowman Vaughns and their direct descendants of Eliza's son, Sir Thomas Jackson. There, there were more letters. 
The painting, which is behind Annabelle and Venetia, includes some of their Lloyd family ancestors, the Lloyds of Beechmount, County Limerick. Three years later, 2006, the next batch of letters, and this was a significant batch. Sir Michael Jackson and his wife Hazel invited me to Jolliffe, County Devon, where they lived. And in this room, there was a tin box which contained 64 letters, which had been found in a bog at Urker. Now, I can't even quite believe that that's where they were, but that is where they were. Uh, and they were retrieved in the mid 1900s. Michael suggested that I take them back to Canada and he gave me two instructions, uh, keep them until I checked them all out, but please do not mention me as their current custodian. So I never did, but he's died a decade afterwards. I do feel free now to say where they were found and I am hugely grateful in his trust that I could take these letters back to Canada and scan them all. Also in 2006, I met three other cousins in Groomsport County down on the left is Dr. Thomas Alexander McNeil and his mother had done extensive research on our shared relations. Seated in the middle is Thomas Andrew Jackson, uh, a great grandson of Eliza Jackson. And he was raised by his grandmother because his mother died in childbirth uh, when he was two years old and his younger brother was born. The, the beauty of this, it's a tragedy obviously, but the beauty is that Thomas had a recollection of the stories of an earlier generation that otherwise I would not have had access to. And finally, Eile Ryder, an absolute character, born at Free Duff. I stayed with her several times. She drove me around. And I have to say that took a lot of personal courage. Uh, Eile's approach to roundabouts, whether or not there was a red light, was to simply charge on through at which point Thomas would uh, yell out, ye shall be baptized. And I just would cower in the back seat. So I just mentioned that as the dangers of doing family research. These litters here are thanks to Gary Barnes uh, from Bangor. Uh, he bought all of the family uh, letters, etc., photographs that were in Eileen's house uh, when she was being put into a, a senior citizen's home. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, Eileen is now in the state of dementia. She's 100 years old. Uh, but these uh, uh, documents came from ones that she'd had, ones that uh, Thomas Andrew Jackson had had, and also ones that came from my great aunt, Blynn Brown, who had been in an old folks home in 1963 when she died. Eileen cleaned out all her stuff. They ended up in this pile. The one thing that didn't end up here, and thank goodness, was that when Blynn died in the old folks home in Belfast, there was a loaded pistol in the closet. However, in the midst of this pile, I suppose there was something equivalent to a loaded pistol. There is a transcription of a document done in Eliza's hand that shocked me. It was a forgery of a Jesuit oath, and I read it and was appalled and I wondered why had Eliza made a copy of this? What did it say about what she believed and when had she made this copy? This is some of the language. I will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle and bury alive these infamous heretics. And it goes on and I'm not gonna go with the whole thing. I felt I had to learn more about it, found out that it was first published in 1670 in this book based on an earlier forgery done in 1610. And its author, interestingly, not only hated Catholics, but also Presbyterians and every other kind of dissenter. And how he got away with this forgery and why it lived on is uh, exposed by a writer, very, very readable. I recommend this book, Blunders and Forgeries. One of the things that he explains is that just as the plague infected London during the 17th century, so was forgery during that time an epidemic throughout England and Ireland. And the following years were only the most notable and atrocious of a series of frauds perpetrated on religious credulity. Uh, the title of Foxes and Firebrands came from a biblical story about firebrands being tied to the tails of foxes and sent into the enemy camp to create chaos which is what lies do. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Let's try again here. So 
there with this pile, there were also a number of transcriptions that Eliza did when she was 13 to 16 years old. At the end of each section of these transcriptions are a comment by the Reverend John Hamilton Stubbs. And in a letter to her, he replied to an issue that she had raised with him. So bear in mind, this is a very young woman, 13 to 16 years old, and she's questioning about the parallel of the unjust steward, which I find quite intriguing given the whole uh, controversies of uh, uh, land ownership and stewards and how it all worked. And so he offered to visit her in the time she was living at Cavanagh with her aunts. Why is this relevant today? I think it is. I recently found this fake Je Jesuit oath posted on Facebook and the context of it is interesting because it says to me something about how these things work. But before I get to that, I just want to comment on Marshall McLuhan, Canadian, I just want to mention that in 1962, talked about the dangers of the global village and how it would force people to retribalize. And he was right, it did. But on the other hand, political events have always caused people to retribalize. And we see this in the 1880s in the letters of Eliza when the politics deepened the divisions in Armagh during the home rule controversy. And her letters shift reflect some of the shifts in these loyalties and her views shifted. Um, and I, again, this is not particular to Ireland. It happens all around the world. So here we have in 2021, the Jesuit oath forgery was recently posted in its entirety on a Georgia University Facebook page in America. It's Robert Ware's most pernicious and successful lie. Now, some of the comments didn't surprise me, things like the Pope is the anti-Messiah Christ. But what did surprise me, but not totally, was the way that it was linked to the next comment, which says today's podcast includes the full truth about mRNA vaccines, prions, mad cow disease, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It seems to me that the global village and the rural village then is now conspiracy theories proliferate in times and places when and where people are feeling fearful and uh, their identity feels threatened. So a few years ago, there was a couple of books that just by accident, I happened to read at the same time. And the fact that that happened that way met, led me to understanding aspects of Eliza that I'm not sure I would have had I not done that. The first one, a book I recommend to all people interested in Irish history is Two Lands on One Soil. And the second one, Robert Sapolsky, Behave the bio Biology of Humans at Our Best and Our Worst. So Sapolsky is a neurologist. And the things to me that are key when I'm reading Eliza's letters are that his research shows that already by the time we're three or four years old, we're already seeing the world in terms of us and them. His research also shows that there's two kinds of people in the world, those who divide the world into two kinds of people and those who don't, and there are more of the first. And I would definitely class Eliza in one of the first, in spite of the fact I think she often tried not to be. And part of the reason for this is we judge ourselves by our act motives and we judge everybody else by their actions, by their impact on us. So when we do something that's kind of not so cool, we're pretty good at forgiving ourselves. Finally, he talks about cooperation and why should people cooperate. Um, talks about how animals do. And uh, schools of fish, you're less likely to be eaten if you're in the safer spot in the center. And so the whole herd, the whole flock, the whole school comes together. And by coming together, they are safer. I won't go, this is the last uh, riff on this kind of thing. He points out that the amygdala, which is right here, handles our freeze or flight responses. The hippocampus is where we store our memories. And in a split second, the amygdala shapes the memories that we store in our hippocampus. And it's not like a DVD that you can take it out and play it again and again. It's more like a game of rumors where every time you play it, a word gets changed. And this, I think, explains a lot of how beliefs and memories and everything take hold, whether it's the global village or the village village. So 
in the 1850s, when Eliza was a, a young wife, the Tenant Right League was fighting for fair rent, fixity of tenure, and free sale. I also want to point out that in 1850, the bailiff seized seven cows, four heifers, and a bull belonging to Mrs. Jackson for failure to pay rent. Now that Mrs. Jackson was Eliza's mother-in-law. At the same time, Cross McGlynn was very effective in collecting significant sums for relief, and this was done by direct cooperation between clergy. And I note that Father Michael Lennon and Reverend Daniel Gunn Brown, the Presbyterian minister, and Eliza's husband, uncle, the two of them worked hand in hand on this. And although Daniel Gunn Brown may have been a hero for what he did and worthy of being a hero, he comes off less well in some of Eliza's letters, which I will get to. So it's that whole thing of public hero, private, well, not so much. Finally, uh, in terms of books that have, have affected me, uh, this book here by Mary Comiskey, and I just want to mention Mary died in February this year. Fabulous woman. I am so grateful that uh, at one point I was able to bring her together with Eileen for a lunch at the Armagh Hotel, and we couldn't stop talking. We were there for at least three hours. So I lied when I said that was the last book. Uh, this book here, uh, I went and bought for myself after I read about it in a letter that Eliza wrote to uh, her son in 1884. And she was going to send Boston's fourfold states to her daughter-in-law. She said, it's one of the best books ever I read. So you can see why I had to have it. Uh, it's definitely a window into the mind of Eliza. One of the things in this letter that hooked my interest is that Eliza was talking about not only Boston, but also two uh, Episcopal church uh, theologians, which gave me a feel for the fact of how far she read when it came to forming her own views. She attended both her husband's Church of Ireland and her family's Presbyterian church. And so here's just a, a few little quotes from Boston that I saw echoed in her letters. Um, in her picture, uh, Adam didn't have the law written on tablets of stone, but on his mind, it was how he was made by God to have the law written inside his mind. And this law, God's law, was to be part of the way that you approach civil affairs, the politics, the running of the village, etc. It was also a positive way of looking at religion, that happiness was a result of holiness. And finally, the whole notion of sin and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Boston saw that as a prop to keep man from failing. And just the fact of knowing it was there as a way of saying, okay, pay attention. So how does this then shape Eliza's and her family's religious beliefs when we see these beliefs translated into action? Well, as I mentioned earlier, Daniel Gunn Brown was active in giving evidence and such uh, at one point, he says, uh, in response to the question, did you on that occasion speak of landlords as exterminators? And he said, I do not think that would be contrary to the fact. Uh, I wrote a blog piece a few years ago where I compared the language of Marx to the language of Daniel Gunn Brown. And it's no surprise how similar they are. Also no surprise, both of them grew up with biblical traditions one Jewish, one Presbyterian, but there were a lot of overlaps. Now, I did mention that Brown and his family did not stay in Eliza's good books. Um, for reasons that I don't know, Brown disinherited his daughter, Lizzie. And Lizzie was the wife of Eliza's son, James. Uh, the family was interconnected in more ways than that, but it gets too complicated. In the letter, she says, Anything more wicked or, un or unnatural than their treatment of Lizzie, I never saw. If ever I know you to do anything for them, and this she's writing to her son, Tom, or pay them any attention, I will work wonders on you. I never intend to go near them again. And by the way, shunning was one of her big ways of dealing with stuff like this. I would as soon visit Redman O'Hanlon if he was to be had, for he was more honest than they are. Several years later, um, and this 
struck me as something that I would never have guessed in a million years that Orangemen were part of the land lake and working on behalf of the rights of tenant farmers, including the Catholic tenant farmers. And in this news article, David Jackson is one of them. So is his son, Eliza Jackson, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Eliza Gilmore, uh, his son-in-law, I should say. And when I look at all these other names, I recognize how related they are to the Jacksons of Urquhart. And I don't have time to go into that here, but this is a reality that was news to me. Um, again, because I'm sort of in this theme now of looking at how do religious beliefs impact actions. Uh, Eliza recommended Roman Catholic children as well as not uh, Presbyterians, Church of Ireland, you name it, to go and work in Hong Kong. And this is one of them. Uh, Mrs. Morris across McGlenn, the wife of the grocer, uh, was looking for a situation for her son, John, excuse me, Joseph. And I actually found Joseph's um, birth certificate below. Um, he's 20 years of age, good education. Now the insight here about the realities of Irish banks is interesting. They're so small and the pay is so bad that in several years, Joseph's older brother could not support himself with help without help from his father. And that's a father who's a grocer of a small town in Ireland. Um, now, there are four points in Eliza's mind that made him a good catch. Um, Joseph, had his, his father had prospered in business. He had a lineage born as good character. He'd been accustomed to business. And his mother assures me that he's perfectly steady. In all of Eliza's letters, by the way, the word steady means he's not a drunk. Uh, so if you have a vacancy, I think he may serve the bank as well as another. She adds they're Roman Catholics, and this is not included as anything negative, just simply a statement of fact. Later in 1893, one of the letters talks about the death of Margaret Rooney. Again, I found her birth certificate, I mean her death certificate, and it's below. Interestingly, Eliza used uh, Margaret's birth name, not her married name, uh, Rooney instead of Duffy. And she then says, I've taken poor Duffy and his three little children to live in the pigeon house. To go up and down to his own land and attend the work there would have killed him if he had as many lives as a cat. And I might give up farming if he was not here. So on the left here is a map of where they lived. They worked on the farm at Cavanagh, and these this Farms in these areas were earned, owned by the Jacksons, the Bradfords, the Coulters, who all intermarried. To me, one of the things that's key is how interdependent they might be. As Eliza said, I might give up farming if he was not here. She needed Duffy. Now, this was not an upstairs, downstairs, as we see in the usual sitcoms uh, in contemporary television. This is Urker Lodge. It's obviously all falling apart these days. Uh, but here we have Eliza's room was upstairs. The pigeon house that she's talking about is just there on the right. On the left is a 1970s edition that Christine Wright did when she and her husband lived there. And when they did this edition and they tore up the floorboards, underneath the floorboards were seeds and hay, etc. And it's very clear that the, the space in this structure underneath here was all used for uh, animals of various ilk. And uh, right here, these rooms here, some of them were used for the hired hands, whether uh, out in the yard or ones who worked in the house. And in 1895, in one of the letters, Eliza says to her son, I forgot to mention that I have now two spare best rooms. I've got a sleeping room made for the servant men outside, which leaves us more room within. Now. That structure, you can't see in the picture, but it's on the other side in behind the, the main part of the building in here. And it's a brick structure that was built at some point uh, where the uh, servant men could live. So behind here is a whole enclosure of farm buildings. And so the Jackson children all played with the children of the, <coughs> the workers, which makes sense of why uh, Sir Thomas would end up buying houses for the children of some of them when he was successful, which he did. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So Eliza didn't only take on the Catholic Church, she took on the Church of Ireland. And in many of her letters, she's ragging after her son Thomas to get his children baptized, to give them a cast of the Scotch Kirk, saying that would save the sin of telling lies over there, that they renounce the devil and all his works, the pomps and vanities of this wicked world, and all the lusts of the fresh flesh is a thing that no one can altogether do in his life. I, I, I like that she emphasizes how hard it is to uh, renounce all this. And also declaring, and this of course is a theological point that she was quite dear to her, uh, he descended into hell when we know well that he finished the work of redemption on the cross. So these were the kinds of discussions that you see again and again in these letters, sometimes right up against the discussion of bank records. At age 80, she's still holding to her anti-Catholic stance and writes to her son Thomas about his son Thomas, who's going to go to Oxford and says, I hope and pray that the old lady of Babylon will never get one of my children or grandchildren. Now that phrase was one used by Sir Walter Scott in his diary of 1829. And Sir Walter Scott was a poet who was uh, quoted more than any other in all of her letters. She clearly knew his works by memory and I'm sure that all of her children did as well. By this point at 80, her letter, handwriting is starting to get shaky and her eyesight was going. So switching now from Eliza's theology to her fears about money in the decades before Sir Thomas made his fortune and bailed out the farm at Urker and purchased Cavanagh, um, very few mothers see their children's faces on banknotes, but that was her reality. But before then, she lived in great fear of financial calamity. This letter is dated in 1860, and it's one of the ones I got thanks to Gary Barnes. Uh, Bessie, uh, who she's writing to, is 17 years old. Eliza is 45. And Bessie is my great grandmother. She married Thompson Brown, uh, the ones who then built the big house in 1883. But here she's writing to Bessie at 17 years old and saying, I assure you, I do not intend to spend my youthful days as I have done. Your father always calculated to strip one of the last farthing while at the same time he would deny himself nothing. I did not come a pauper into this family, although I have been as humble and self-denying as if I had. Remember she had a dowry of 300 pounds which only left him more to destroy, and he did destroy all I ever saved. He never knew what it was either to feed, clothe, or educate his children. If I had insisted from the first upon being supported as I was well entitled to, it would have given him something else to think of than indulging every whim that came into his own head. People should not forget their own rights any more than the rights of others. That phrase in particular just blows me away. Uh, that, to me, could be said by a contemporary feminist. I am as poor as Job's cat. The high price of the hay is, I suppose, preventing people from buying it. And I have neither tobacco for the men nor tea for myself. I am living in fear of some of the creditors. So how did this come about? Well, <laughs> the whole bunch of family wills made things go sideways. And some of the calamities... Uh, I put a pinball machine here because that's the only way I can start to make sense of it. Things just pinballed all over the place. Uh, the first one, starting with Thomas Bradford of Cavanagh, who died in 1790. Um, he left his wife, age 32, with five young children. We have here Elizabeth, who was Eliza's mother. She married Benjamin Oliver. And Elizabeth at this time was five years old. Andrew Coulter Bradford, who became the guardian of Eliza and her sister, was only two years old. And these kinds of ages when uh, the baton is passed from one generation to another, absolutely critical. Um, the 1813 will of Benjamin Oliver, uh, in this mill, he made two key errors. Uh, and Eliza's letters are often hot with her opinions about that, and they add color to all of the machinations behind the scenes as families all had their elbows up looking for their own interests. Um, and it created an intergenerational family dispute which lasted for years, and also lots of court cases. So the first mistake was that Benjamin's brother, James Oliver, who was an ex-executor of the 1813 will, 
had a son, John Oliver. And after 1852, John Oliver had inherited rights from James to some of the land that Benjamin had bequeathed only to his children. And in the next generation, John Oliver's son, who is another John Oliver of Ballycrummy, continued to have a right to some of this inheritance. And that John Oliver and his wife, Margaret Rock, are the ancestors of current day Olivers of Ballycrummy. And I just want to point out that it's taken DNA and the work of Carolyn Henry, who's here today, Francis Oliver, whose wife Maureen is here, and myself to prove the links between these two lines of Olivers. Now in 1825, Benjamin created a trust, which was lightly triggered by the death of his wife, Eliza Bradford, that year. It was attached as a codicil to the will, but he made a mistake of not including the name of his youngest living son, Andrew Bradford Oliver, who was seven. Even though Andrew's older sister, Eliza, was included, as was his younger sister, Mary Jane. Benjamin's wife's brother, Andrew Coulter Bradford, was appointed guardian of the minor children, and his will, 15 years after Benjamin's death, provoked even more chaos. I can't take time to get into all of this because it will go too long for what I'm trying to stick within, but the long and the short of it is that Elizabeth Jackson ended up with annuities not paid to her and the value of the assets diminished thanks to mismanagement by the trustees. And in her letters, she gets furious with the Gilmores and the ones who were managing it. One thing I just want to point out in terms of the letter that we saw earlier is to highlight the fact that in this 1847 will of Andrew Coulter Bradford, which is the same year that David Jackson probably lost the rights to the farm that he had in County Leitrim when he had married Eliza. It says for the sole and separate use and on the sole and separate receipt of the said Eliza Jackson without her husband joining therein or being liable to his debts or engagements and as if she were sole and unmarried. I, I'm not sure I've seen that stated that boldly uh, in many documents. Again, another will, Eliza Donaldson, echoes the same kind of thing, free from the power. This is, she gave uh, 300 pounds to Eliza Jackson's sole use and benefit, free from the power or control of her husband. One thing to point out about that money, it came at a particularly helpful time because it enabled Eliza to send her son Thomas to Morgan School in Dublin, where he got the kind of education that enabled him to become a banker, which enabled him to save the farm. Uh, her mother, Barbara Bradford, her will was uh, dated 1859. Again, put a great firewall up against David Jackson getting his fingers on any of it. Finally, an 1875 will of Mary Jane Oliver, the younger sister of Eliza, where Eliza doesn't get a benefit, but what she gets is forgiveness of a loan that had gone to her husband and forgiveness of the interest that he never paid. So the entire family was very organized about making sure that Eliza was protected and that David Jackson could not get his hands on the money. So in 1880, uh, when Eliza's older brother, uh, his, he died um, and his, the land at Kilinor was going to be sold and again, she said, it was my poor father's neglecting to settle his affairs that did the whole mischief. So this was the summation of the whole thing. So clearly, uh, Thompson Brown and his wife, Bessie, Eliza's daughter, were able to buy the land because three years later, they built the big house. Also in 1880, this letter to me is interesting in terms of politics and farming, uh, describing we've got our crop all in except the turnips. Spring was favorable. However, there's going to be some trying times until the new potatoes come. She mentions that none of the Duchess of Marlborough's friends came to the neighborhood, which were part of the famine relief, uh, but some of the Lord Mayors did. This next paragraph gave a window to something I didn't know about. People getting seed potatoes in Castle Blaney on Wednesday and selling them in Cross on Friday, that was done continually. Doesn't surprise me, wasn't something I knew. Uh, and then she 
throws in a comment about Gladstone, uh, who had resigned. Disraeli had come in for a while. And Gladstone was coming back. And Eliza, in many of her letters, was no fan of Disraeli. So in 1880, that fall, uh, she now mentions to her son Thomas, the debts that were the burden and plague of my life are now all paid. Everything is ex settled except the rent of Urker. I never hoarded a shilling in my life, nor never intend to do so. All I ever saved for was to pay debts and to buy things that required. And then she talks about how much her son had made this all possible. Now, Samuel Bradford was one of the ones who made life miserable for Eliza, and she just gloried in his losses. And he was good at messing up. Uh, here she's talking about the election and, uh, of 1880, April 1880. Uh, and you know my opinion of Beaconsfield. I'm happy to tell you that his siege is over and an unlucky siege it was. He found the country in peace and prosperity. He will leave in a foreign war and domestic misery. But the real part, I think, in some way, is the, is the juice is in the last paragraph. There was a real Irish shindig in Dundalk last week. Boxing, stone throwing, window breaking, etc. The two candidates for the borough boxed in the courthouse. Our dear cousin Sam took a warm interest in one of the candidates, but the one he favored did not win. And the mob went through the town singing, we'll hang Sam Bradford on a sour apple tree. Sam's popularity stands at zero, notwithstanding all his mean compliances with the uh, parliamentary party. So she takes special delight in her letters anytime she can make Sam Bradford look bad. And so here's one of them. Uh, she's really annoyed with him at this point. Uh, he has been cutting down trees and selling the timber when he shouldn't have. He's mismanaging the farm. The cattle are dying. It's a total mess. However, she's telling the story about Sam fell out with his mother. So he put a bed and bedding into a float and set out for Kavanagh, accompanied by a confidential man of his. They arrived at 10 o'clock at night and left at four the next morning. I would like to know their experience of the site, but they told no one and kept the whole matter as quiet as possible. The place is said to be haunted, but I know what the ghost is, just the roaring of the chimneys in the empty house. She doesn't uh, savor this particular story just once. She savors it again. Did I write you that Sam endeavored to sleep a night in Cavanagh and had to fly out of it before evening? He fled actually naked, durst not venture back for his clothes, but had to send a man for them. But she also talks about the poor old perpetual. And this is again where this came up again and again and again, the offense that people gave her by uh, managing the Kavanagh uh, wills and the legacies in ways that were really harmful to her. One of the phrases that occurs repeatedly in her letters is to heap coals of fire on his head. So I'd never heard that phrase before. Uh, so I thought, okay, let me check out the family Bible. And I happen to have Eliza's daughter, Betty's Bible, uh, which had been passed on to me, found the phrase in Proverbs and in Romans. And apparently there was a custom of carrying a pan of burning coals on one's head as a sign of repentance. The biblical take was that kindness and forgiveness to those who abuse us will make them ashamed and hopefully bring them to repent. It's sort of passive aggressive, it seems to me, but anyway. Also that the strongest and most powerful response to persecution and hatred is to love your enemies. I'm going to just whip through these, but here she's talking about the McCullough's Adrumic, where she heaped coals of fire on their heads. Uh, uh, many more times a year later, heaping coals of fire, thanks to the help she's getting from her son. Uh, this one particularly delicious to her because Daniel Gunn Brown wrote asking for 35 pounds, promising to pay at May, and she sent him 40 pounds. I've heaped coals of fire on many a head this year. Finally, the McCulloughs, again, who were ones who had done ill towards her in her uh, take on it uh, with respect to Kavanaugh, and, and I heaped coals of fire on them, which set a good example to others. So, Judging, I guess I'm judging a little bit when I say the passive aggressive thing about coals of fire, but um, maybe that's part of being human. And uh, anyway, I won't, 
let me just put that aside for a moment. Uh, this is a picture of two people, uh, part of the family uh, archives. And uh, you look at it and what does it look like? He's a minister. Yeah, she's his wife. It's not until you read the letters that you find what's behind this story. And here we are, 1893, July the 11th. We have heard nothing from Sally McCullough since she landed in New York. I never got a greater surprise than that marriage. I never heard of it or dreamed of it till one morning, I got a letter from her saying that Mr. Whiteside was going to California and then she intended to go with him and asking my permission to be married from this house, which is Urker, on a day in the same week. I was struck of a heap, but of course I made them welcome and entertained them as well as I could. They were married by Mr. Reed in Cragen Presbyterian Church. That would be at Free Duff. They're very fond of each other. And one pleasant feature in the case is that she's going to the town where her brother Johnny resides. He's a widower with a large family and she may be useful to him and he to her. 1894, March 28th, your favorite, she's writing to her son, Thomas, your favorite Sarah McCalla had a fine young son born sometime in January. Her letters are cheerful. She seems to be comfortable and happy. Now, Eliza wasn't born yesterday. She knew what was going on. The backstory is that Sarah McCullough uh, was a daughter of Thomas and Sarah McCullough of Derry Valley. She married Reverend William Sherlock Whiteside on April 1893. Two days earlier, he'd resigned because of ill health. He had been the minister there and they left for New York the day after their marriage. Their son was born five and a half months later on October the 1st, 1893. And eventually they moved to Australia where they lived a long and happy life. Now, Eliza wasn't judgmental of Sarah, but she was extremely judgmental of her daughter, Mary Minari, and her affair with Fred Griffin. I don't have time to get into all of this. There were, she mentioned in many letters. Some of them are in an article that I did just recently in the Craig and Historical Society. So when Eliza's widowed daughter, Mary Minari, fell in love with Frederick Griffin and then married him, Eliza cut off all contact or support of any kind and encouraged others to do so as well. Fred was 14 years younger than Mary and not steady, which meant that he enjoyed his drink and he did. Eliza called him a peacock, and some of her fears were about money, and I, I think those were well-founded. After he died, Eliza reconciled with her daughter, and Mary moved into Urker with her daughter, and together they took care of Eliza in her declining years. Finally, John Jackson uh, was the firstborn of Eliza's children, and in terms of judging, I find this one particularly touching. Uh, John suffered from being in the shadow of his younger brother Thomas and throughout his life struggled with alcohol addiction and in later life Eliza recognized the harm that she had caused and she wrote to Thomas saying I have not heard from Johnny very lately but the last accounts were not good. Ah dear Tom take warning by me and tell your wife to do so too. Never make a favorite of one child above the rest. I did that and see how I am punished for it. Uh, I would add that addiction does appear intergenerationally in the Jackson family, so the cause may not lie totally at Eliza's feet, but game on her for owning that. Her last years were lived contentedly. 1887, she says, your father and I are just like a newly married couple, living quietly, but we are very well contented. Uh, several months later, the old governor and I are quite alone, just like a newly married couple. We are both well, for I need not complain of my ears. It gives me no pain. It's not worth speaking about. By the way, at this point, she was stone deaf. Um, eight months later, her husband died. Uh, the picture, which was taken before he died, shows Eliza on the left at age 84, her daughter, Sarah Gilmore, her granddaughter, Mary Jane Bartley, and her great-granddaughter, Eileen Oliver Bartley, who became a medical doctor and who was responsible for much of the documentation upon which this history rests. Eliza died at Urker, October 23, 1903, three months after the death of her son, David Jackson in Yokohama. She was buried with her husband at Cragen, not at Kane County Louth, where her mother and aunts were buried. There's no marker on her grave. 
and there is a gap showing where at least one gravestone was stolen. But that gravestone was not the one that would have mentioned her. I've got a transcription of it. In her very last letter, at least the last of the ones that I have, she says, Fanny insists that I wait to write to you, though I'm not able to do it. It is not in my memory when I write a letter. She is re rejoiced at your occasion of title, but you know that I never considered titles any better than a, a word I couldn't read. And the only thing gratifying to me in the office is that I know that your labors and merits were appreciated. This is just after he was made a baronet, uh, after having been made a knight three years earlier. I know that you will never forget that you are a farmer's son, no more than I do that I am a farmer's daughter. To me, this is key to understanding her sense of self. So have we moved her out of the shadows? She was orphaned as a child, instilled with us them beliefs at an early age, and yet she acted with some compassion, considerable compassion towards many kinds of people. She was obviously opinionated and a stout defender of rights and faith. She rarely bent in her opinion and yet she could admit sometimes to some mistakes. As a mother of 10 children, eight of whom survived her, one died in infancy, she lived with constant fear for the health of sons who lived on the other side of the world. While she continued to face frequent financial fears and uncertainty, she kept up to date and fully informed about politics and the HSBC bank account reports. After all, many other staff were hired on her say so. She loved the Gov, as she called him throughout their long marriage. And in 1895, she writes, he was an affectionate, kind hearted man. And it was a pity that he had any faults. I thought I'd close being a little bit cheeky and saying, nevertheless, she persisted. And that's a quote from uh, the leader of the uh, Republican Senate in America when he was uh, dressing down Elizabeth Warren after he had mansplained everything to her. So I will end on that note and pass the torch back and I'm gonna stop the share.